Well, a group of left-wing activists in Chicago is training itself for war. It's called the Haymaker Collective, and it says that Donald Trump's election has caused a surge of fascist violence in America, and they want to establish their own anti-fascist gym to teach the left how to fight back. Nyla is a member of the Haymaker Collective and is a participant in the new gym project. It's not a real name, by the way, but a pseudonym we were given. Nyla joins us tonight. Nyla, thanks a lot for coming on. Fight! Thank you for having me. So, um, I'm, I'm here to take you seriously. You're starting a gym to prepare yourself for the coming war, for the conflict. We're, what are you preparing yourself for? The, the conflict has already been established. We've seen since 2016 there's been a 20% increase in hate crimes, both nationally and in the city of Chicago. We know that there are certain bodies that are vulnerable to attack, that there's been an increase in racism and xenophobia, and that we feel that it's necessary for us to learn self-defense skills so rather than feeling fright frightened and isolated and alone that we can come together build strength in solidarity with one another with an autonomous gym formation look i'm for free association i'm for gyms i'm not i guess against this i just sort of wonder if your concern isn't misplaced i mean chicago is a really dangerous place i think you've had about two thousand shootings so far just this year I don't think any of them are perpetrated by right-wingers that I know of or Trump supporters, any of them. So maybe well, you've got other things to worry about. Well, according to statistics, we do have something to worry about. The Cato Institute records that the vast majority of violent extremism comes from white, right-wing white nationalists. We uh -huh. also know that, 80, that according to statistics, 80% of deadly terrorist incidents that happen within the United States are perpetuated by people who feel that other bodies, any pe a different people, races, and religions don't belong. Right. So when I think about the threats that I'm facing, those are made up. I'm so pretty much worth. I mean, I don't want to interrupt you, but those are totally made up statistics. That you should spend some time looking at them. But let me just ask you this: of the 2,000 you are welcome to look at. You are oh, no, welcome to look at the statistics. Okay. They're provided right. by the Cato Institute. They're also right. provided by California State University. I, right. oh, I oh, well, also have done. a number of statistics you got, you got that are provided there. by but let me just ask you the this. Southern just, Poverty Law Center. Okay. Oh, okay. Kind of the bottom line, I guess. Um, but if we could just bring it from the national to the local. You live in Chicago, which, as I just said, I think, and I think this is a correct statistic, has had about 2,000 murders just in the first seven months, less than seven months of the year. How many, uh, rather, shootings? How many of those 2,000 shootings were perpetrated by right-wingers, do you think? Um, again, you can look at the Chicago Police Department. They do collect information, but we're, in, we're more interested in the hate crimes that have been occurring were, were any to people of them? like myself. Okay, right, but I mean, when people are shooting each 2,000 people, okay, shot, and I don't think any of them were biased crimes against people like you, as you just put it. I don't think any of those were Trump supporters pulling the trigger. Do you know otherwise? Car Carlson, if you don't know, then I'm not going to sit here and give you statistics, but I will tell you that the stories that are making me afraid and no careful is the answer, when I take actually. the bus No, when I take the bus home alone by myself on public transportation, I don't feel safe because just May twenty sixth in Portland on the light, right, light rail, there were two black women who were approached and confronted by a white man who calls himself a patriot. Three other white men came to those two women's defense and they were stabbed in the neck and two of them died. Right, when no, you no, think no, about I saw the it was an awful story, but 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 I'm just saying in the city that you live in, because you don't live in Portland, Oregon, you live in Chicago, Illinois. Again, I made the point, but you've had 2,000 shootings, and none of them were by Trump supporters. But that doesn't bother you. But a stabbing on a train in Portland, Oregon, is the reason you're afraid to ride the train in Chicago. It seems a little bit disassociated. Where are you on the question well, of gun Tucker, ownership? I mean, well, Tucker, here's the thing. First of all. Uh, on the question of what we're doing, we're providing a self-defense gym so that people I'm may learn I mean, martial I'm not arts. That. Yep. So that then, so that people can learn martial arts, so people like me don't feel like they can't ride public transportation or right, go to their I'm houses saying, of worship. I'm not a shrink harassed. or anything, but I'm just worried that your fears may be a little bit then, overblown. Like you've got a terrible gang problem in Chicago, but that doesn't does that scare you at all? Like if you were to go to the south well, side of Chicago, would you be worried about Trump supporters down there? Uh, Tucker, I already live on the south side, number one. Number two, I'm How many Trump supporters in your neighborhood? 
quite a few, I'm sure you can look it up. But on the question of gun ownership, we can look that even how owning a gun doesn't protect one. Philando Castile was a licensed gun owner, and he told yeah. that to the officer while he was shot on Facebook Live in front of his four-year-old daughter and his partner. So right. the question so, so of you don't, gun ownership you should be something that should you should be giving to the National Rifle Association as to why they're not taking Wait, can I ask some questions. Can, can I ask a question? If, if so, you're like against the system and you think the system is rotten and racist and all that stuff, but you want only the cops and other government officials who you believe are racist to have guns? How does that work exactly, Nyla? I don't understand your question. What we're saying well, is that so there's no political Well, so if you no think America is institutionally racist, why do you think only government officials, police, National Guard, soldiers, ought to have guns? I mean, why wouldn't you want a gun, too? I don't understand well, why our, you're against private again, gun ownership if you think our country's racist. If you're bringing me on your show to talk about the project that we're starting, the project we're starting is a self-defense gym so that people can learn hand-to-hand self-defense I got it. It's just like guns so are more are effective than karate chops, so I'm just sort of wondering where you are on the gun thing. Okay, well, on the question of guns, we don't have an answer because what we're doing is starting a project with where okay. we are. And what we need to, we know is that we need to grow strength together. We have to learn okay. the responses physically to respond to some of these incidents that are happening. Okay. The question for me, again, is not on the uh, people sh shooting me with guns. The question is incidents like Nabra Hassanin, who was murdered while she was walking from her mosque in Washington, D.C. to a McDonald's for breakfast with a group of other teenagers. Was a she killed by a Trump supporter? Oh, oh wasn't she, was she? I thought she was killed by an illegal alien, wasn't she? She she was killed by a man who decided to go after her with oh, a bat. Oh, yeah, and that was not a Trump teenagers. supporter, actually. That was an illegal alien. <laughs> Bad example, I'm sure there were others. Now, we're out of time, unfortunately. Well, it was great to talk to you. I don't know why. Sorry. alien from El Salvador getting a six-figure payout from taxpayers courtesy of the city of San Francisco. Like many places in California, San Francisco is a sanctuary city. It pledges not to turn illegals over to the feds for deportation. Despite that policy, though, Pedro Figueroa Zarcino, he's an illegal alien from El Salvador, says police reported him to ICE when he visited a police station two years ago. He sued the city after that, and this week officials agreed to pay him $190,000 for the indignity of having the law enforced against him in a country he's not supposed to be in. Keep in mind, that's more than double San Francisco's median household income. The moral? Crime pays in San Francisco. Roberto Hernandez is an immigration activist in that city, and he joins us tonight. Round two. Roberto, thanks a lot for coming on. Flash. So. Here's someone who is in this country illegally sues because the country enforced its own laws against him legally and then gets paid by the taxpayers of that country. Is there another place in the world where that happens? Well, first of all, let's talk about the failure of this country to do immigration reform. No, no, no. First that's of all, let's talk about the specifics Sam, of what happened. In Sam, wait, hold on. But, let's, 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 I don't want to lecture on immigration. Yeah, but Sam, let's talk about the specific case. Sa Does that happen anywhere else? But San Fran no, it, but San Francisco had to create its own sanctuary law because of the failure of the federal government. So can you oh. imagine that a law is passed and for two months you get incarcerated for showing up to the police department to reclaim your stolen car? Because that's what he did, correct? He was in the country illegally. The theft of his car was one crime, but he had committed a crime himself by being here illegally. The police turned him over to the feds who wanted him, and now the city is paying him for enforcing American law. And I'm just noting the obvious, which is, that's insane. You shouldn't pay a criminal for breaking the law. And that's what San Francisco was doing. But San Francisco has a sanctuary law, correct? That law was enacted because the federal government failed to do reform for immigration. Congress oh. failed, the Senate failed, Clinton failed, Bush failed, Obama failed. So no, San Francisco, being San Francisco, okay. made sure that it protected those but just so you know, I mean, they works. failed to pass laws right. that you like, but our current immigration laws were passed by Democrats and Republicans 
in the Congress of the United States, in Washington, the system worked as it's supposed to work. People voted in public on these laws. The Republicans didn't do this. Democrats did it too. And it's the law. And so if you don't like it, then you go and you elect people who will change it. But until you do that, you can't ignore the law. That's how the system works. Again, here the United States has been involved in wars in El Salvador because he's from El Salvador, correct? He's from El Salvador. The United States was involved in in the war in El Salvador, supported that war. And then after the war, it was Carter and Reagan and all the presidents after that that welcomed people from El Salvador and Nicaragua and Guatemala to come here as refugees. Okay, but he didn't come what here as a refugee. What did the government do? Oh, hold on. So, so down. He did not come here as a refugee. He's here illegally. He does not have legal status in the country. So my question is, why does this just well, apply to... Well, a lot of the people who came here as refugees don't have... Well, have but he's not, he's not one of them. Part so of the what, problem, what you're saying is a non sequitur. But I'm just asking, why problem, does this... Hold on. Why does this just apply to illegal aliens? Why don't I benefit from this? If I'm wanted for tax evasion in another state and the San Francisco police turn me over to the feds, why shouldn't I be able to sue the city of San Francisco for cooperating with the federal authorities? Why, why do only illegal aliens it, have this privilege in your but city? But it's, it's a law. I mean, and then let's take a look, look what Wait, but hold on. Why, the But sheriff. why does the law just protect illegals? Why does it protect American citizens? I mean, if I commit a crime in Washington and I go to the open arms of San Francisco as a tax fugitive, why aren't you protecting me? Why are you just protecting illegals? I don't understand. But he didn't co commit a crime. He's yeah, living he's here in a illegally. city that there he's is. Here. He's living in a city that has a sanctuary law that protects him. Right, but San Francisco's not a country yet. I mean, that could happen, and I'm sure you're agitating for it. But as of right now, it's a component of a larger country called America, which has control of its border. San Francisco doesn't make immigration policy; the federal government does because it's a country. So, uh, but you're, do you're yeah, dodging but, my question. But, but, Why are we extending these privileges only to illegal aliens and not to me, an American citizen, who would like to, you know, I don't know, violate a law in another state and hide out in your city? But you're protected. I'm protected. But we have, look no, at I'm the not. sheriff from Arizona. The sheriff from Arizona, currently isn't he being charged in a criminal case because he violated the law? Okay. I'm, I'm not following your logic here, but I'd really like to pin you down on this question. So San Francisco says that one group of people does not have to follow federal law, illegal aliens. But it doesn't extend that protection. San Francisco has no other laws that I'm aware of that say to actual Americans, you don't have to obey this or that federal law. Only illegal aliens. And that strikes me as discriminatory. Someone who's born here and paid taxes on my whole working life, why do I not benefit? As long as you guys are ignoring the law, why are you only doing so on behalf of illegal aliens and not on behalf of American citizens? Why not become a real sanctuary? Well, you know, but you're, you're from San Francisco, just like I am. Born and raised in San Francisco. That's right. And San Francisco, we're, we're different. We are progressive. We think different. We're leaders when it comes to being human, humanitarians. But why aren't you like helping me? If you're, if you're, humanita we, if you're a humanitarian leader, marriages, why aren't you helping me we, avo we avoid American tax people. law? And look, and look across the country, because we started to marry gay people, they, the rest of the country followed. We created sanctuary law, then the rest of the country followed. It's okay. neat. It's when your federal government is okay, failing you're not, I don't you. think you're tracking with my questions then here. You I'm just asking one, 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 last, one last question. Do, why do you think that other countries don't do this? So if I go to Mexico, for example, illegally, I get put in jail uh, for a longer term than an illegal would here. Why can't I sue the Mexican government for being mean to me and expect Mexican taxpayers to pay me? Uh, for the indignity of, of having Mexican law enforcement. L L are you, are you want to go to Mexico? How many yeah. people live in Mexico that are not legal citizens, that are white, that come from the United States? Huh? Check out those I, I don't statistics. know. Probably not very many because they, they think they throw they, you in jail if they you do don't that. Because they, they actually believe do in their own country and they enforce their own Mexico law. When they go to Mexico. Right. Okay. Roberto, good luck out there. Thank you. Fatality. Well, sabotaging U.S. elections and eating children aren't Russia's only foreign policy goals. They're also firmly committed to fighting ISIS, which they're doing. And now it appears possible that Russian forces may have killed the head of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. The Syrian Human Rights Group announced today it has, quote, confirmed information pointing toward the death of Baghdadi.
whether or not it's true. It's interesting. It could be a big victory in the war on terror. So why aren't more in the U.S. more excited about it? And should we be willing to work with Russia against Islamic extremism? Ralph Peters is a retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel, and he joins us tonight. Colonel, thanks a lot for coming on. Hey, glad to speak with you, Tucker. And for the record, yes, maybe your friends take money from foreign governments. I don't, and my friends don't. I hope, I hope they don't. It's appalling how much of that happened. It and it's appalling big. how much of our policy is influenced by foreign governments. And you may see that at work now. The Saudis are dead set, of course, against Iran, and they have every reason to be. But I'm hearing a lot of people in Washington, and other Gulf states all feel the same way, a lot of people in Washington say all of a sudden, well, maybe, you know, defeating ISIS isn't such a victory. We've all been focused on defeating the Sunni terror threat embodied by ISIS, and now as we're moving toward achieving that, all of a sudden Iran is the real problem. Why shouldn't we take a moment to celebrate the potential death of Baghdadi? Well, indeed we should. Uh, but it's, uh, I would not jump to the con conclusion that the Russians killed him. They actually walked back their claim that they'd killed him. And if you look at the timelines, the odds are pretty good that if he's dead, and let's hope he is dead, he was killed by a coalition-backed aircraft. Because the Russians have not been seriously fighting ISIS. The Russians in Syria have been bombing hospitals, clinics, refugee columns, schools. And oh, by the way, uh, they've been bombing the people we've been supporting, the anti-Assad opposition, Whereas we, they have been letting us take care of ISIS, and we've done a good job. Well, I mean, there's, Russians are certainly brutal, and so I have no trouble believing anything that you just said. But you want an alliance with them? I, I don't know why we wouldn't. And, I, and well, I, it's, it's confusing to me why, when you have a power like Russia, which obviously has interests that diverge Mars, but had some that align here, they've lost a lot of people to Sunni terrorism. Why wouldn't we cheer them on in their effort to stamp it out? Well, certainly we would, uh, but. We can't have a, an anti-terror alliance with terrorists, which is what the Russians are. They're not Islamist terrorists, and they hate the United States of America. Again, bombing hospitals, clinic schools. But how about you know, uh, murdering dissidents and uh, journalists at home and abroad? You're bad. No, we have nothing in common with the Russians. Why don't More we... or less than we do with the Saudis, our allies Well, the Saudis, the Saudis are, I have no brook for the Saudis whatsoever. Really, because they're our main allies in this. They're right? not my main ally. And, you know, I was... I was warning about the Saudis decades ago, and you can read what I wrote about them. And the problem with Iran is that Iran is now, we've alienated just about everybody. We've blown it right and left in the Middle East. And now you've got Iran building an empire that will stretch from western Afghanistan to the Mediterranean. We've been doing a great job fighting ISIS. Uh, we've got the Iraqis, the Kurds, especially, moving in the right direction. But when ISIS is defeated, and it will be defeated and crush the caliphate, essentially is no more. When it is, we will not be welcome, but the Iranians will be. Because we have never had a strategy, we don't have a strategy, and we won't because we play jailbird checkers, and the Iranians and the Russians play But chess. I'm a little bit confused on a couple fronts. One, we've had over 3,000 Americans killed in this country by about a dozen acts of terror in the last 16 years. None of them committed by Shiites. None of them. Yeah, All of them by Sunni extremists. So we actually don't face any domestic threat from Iran. We That's do face absolutely a, right. a massive threat from Sunni terrorists supported by Saudi Arabia and all these countries we say are our friends. A. B. If we're so afraid of Iran, then why did we kill Saddam Hussein, thereby empowering Iran? Because, we, because we were stupid. And Iraq... But why are the same people who supported that stupid act, the one you described as stupid, now agitating for a war with Iran? I'm confused. Well, I don't... I, just, I certainly personally don't know anyone who's agitating for a war with Iran. I do. I know a lot of people. Okay, well, you know different people than I do. I know people that think that we have to eventually stand up to the Iranians, thanks to President Obama's outright cowardice and the shameful uh, treatment of our sailors, for which John Kerry thanked the Iranians yes. when Disgusting. they were captured. But, you know, the Middle East is, is a very, very complex world. And we refuse to think clearly about it and honestly about it, just as you pointed out. Uh, no Americans have been killed on, uh, in the United States by Shia terrorists, yes. Sunni terrorists. And yet, uh, our president just went to Saudi Arabia and praised the Saudis to the skies. Our president seemed determined to, to do any deal he can with the Russians. And the Russians hate, Vladimir Putin hates us. He is malevolent. And you, he, he is as close to pure evil as I can find. He's also brilliant. And so I don't understand why any American would want an alliance with Russia. We should be strengthening our alliances with democracies. Instead of trashing NATO, we should be building it up much more strongly. Uh, why, why attack Australia? Why attack Canada? For God's sake, I think, I it's think about Western fair civilization. Point. It's just hard to see why, and I'm not vouching for Putin's character, which he seems like a shady guy, a strong man for sure, wouldn't want to live there. He's a killer. 
hard to see why he's a threat to us. And, and how many wars can we fight at once? How many people can, can we be in an opposition to at once? Why not just accept that people who are bad people share our interests and side with them? You sound like Charles Lindbergh in 1938 saying, Hitler hasn't attacked us. I beg your pardon? Come slow down. On. Hey, slow down, Colonel. Oh. I, I'm not in Please, any way. You cannot compare me to someone who would make apologies for Hitler. And I don't think Putin is well, comparable make, to Hitler. I think Putin is. Look, I think it's Putin, a grotesque overstatement. Putin actually. is. Well, I think. I think Putin, it's insane. Putin. Fine. You can think it's insane all you want. You just compared me to a Nazi apologist because I asked a simple question. Which is, well, slow down. Hero. Slow down. No, which no. is, no, why does it contravene American interests in a common Vladimir cause with a group Putin that's trying to kill ISIS? He invaded his neighbors, broken the long peace in Europe. He assassinates dissidents and journalists. He bombs women and children on purpose in Syria. He is as bad as Hitler. And I'm sorry, if, you know, if you don't like the Charles Lindbergh thing, I will retract that. But let's just say you sound like someone in the 1938 saying, what's Hitler done to us? Putin is I would the hate to go Hitler. back. I would hate to go back and read your columns assuring America that taking out Saddam Hussein will make the region calmer, more peaceful, and America safer. When, in fact, it has done exactly the opposite, and it has empowered Russia and Iran, the two countries you say you fear most. Let's just be totally honest here. We don't always know the outcomes. Right. They're not entirely predictable. And so maybe we should lower the moral tone a little bit. Okay, well, we'll pop, Rather than calling people accommodationists and say, we're not exactly well, sure what's going to happen. We can only you, make good decisions you made, day by day. You made your career being an American conservative patriot. And now you're suddenly cheering for Vladimir Putin? I'm not in any sense cheering for Vladimir Putin. Well, you said it's you not accommodate. It's not, it's not, I'm cheering for America as always. Our interests good. ought to come first. And to the extent that making temporary alliances with other countries serve our interests, I'm in favor of that. <laughs> making sweeping moral claims, grotesque ones, comparing people to Hitler, advances the ball not one inch. Vladimir actually. Putin it us is to reality. Horrible. He hates America. He wants to hurt us. And I'm sorry. All this, suddenly Vladimir Putin's a good guy. Russia's okay. No, it's not. Russia is so evil. So what's your Russia moral test? So some, okay, so we cannot in any way do business or make common cause with a country whose leader is, quote, evil, who is, quote, a bad person. That takes most of the world off the table. Most countries are run by really bad people. You are That's talking not the about, question. You're not talking about dealing with them. You're talking about an alliance, an anti-terror alliance. Come on, that's talking very, very about, different. Talking about, first step, cheering on any attacks made by Russia against our mortal enemy, our real enemy, ISIS. Why not just say, that's great, I don't like Putin. I'm not living in Russia. I'm not taking money from the guy, but like a good deed is a good deed no matter who commits it. Why don't oh, you just say that? Putin isn't killing ISIS primarily. He's attacking the anti-Assad people while letting us fight ISIS. And are you convinced? And do you speak Arabic, by the way? No, I don't. Oh, you don't? Okay, so. How's your it, Russian? It, it's non-existent. Okay. And I would never claim to be a Russia expert. But well, I'm not sitting here Putin. talking about groups about whom I know very little, and I bet you're well, in yes, that you category, are. in Syria and saying they're freedom fighters, they're serving the interest of freedom or democracy or American interests, when in fact, a lot of these groups, we know very little about them. And some of them are truly bad people who don't have our interest at heart. And we're not backing the truly bad people. And how about Assad? Well, how do we know that? Yeah, is Assad a good guy? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if we align, if ask we the Christians align, and Jews if, who if, lived in Syria. If we align, <laughs> we if we align <laughs> with Russia, we are uh -huh. aligning with Iran. We are aligning with Assad. And that's bad because that's bad for American interests because why? Do you think Iran is good for American interests? I think Iran's a bad country and in a lot of ways against American American interests. But within the context of Syria, Assad was much better for America than the people I believe you hope to replace him with. The Kurds? How about the Kurds? So the Kurds are going to run Syria? No. Now we're gonna, in fantasy land. No, they're going to have an inter independent state. You're going to break up Syria into lots of little countries. Well, I'm not like, going to break it up. It's okay, going but that, to break that's up. The because it works so well in Iraq? Yeah. Well, it hasn't broken up yet. And the problem with Iraq was in 2003 when we had the chance, we didn't break it up. We didn't break it up. Last question. Would you, knowing what you know now, and I, and I hate to revisit this, but since you brought it up, knowing what you know now, that the deposing Saddam, his subsequent death, empowered Iran dramatically, and in fact, we explicitly helped Iran gain traction in Iraq. Do you think that was a wise idea? And do you think there are any lessons going forward in Syria that maybe when you take out a secular leader, the vacuum is filled by even worse people? Well, I think there's a, that's a, that is a valid point you can make. Yes, it often is. happens. But in 2003, we did a great thing inexcusably badly. Um, I'm a Rumsfeld killing the MP brigades. There are a lot of reasons for it. We believed, we believed any any... Iraqi emigre who spoke English with an Oxford accent and wore a well-tailored suit. Um, 
I mean, again, our intentions were great, but if I had it to do over again, no, I would not get rid of Saddam Hussein because we hadn't thought it through. Uh, my mistake. And, but you're confident that we've thought through what comes after Assad, who's run the country for decades, pretty peacefully, actually? I think killing half a million of, of your own people probably doesn't mean you should re remain in charge. Now, what that, well, after the Civil War. I'm not making apologies for Bashar al-Assad. I mean, well, like, that happened like after. I'm it not. sounds like you're sitting here and making apologies for See, him. The, so because I'm asking rational questions about what's best for America, I'm a friend to strong men and dictators. No, I, I, that is a conversation stopper, no, this not, is not a beginning a, this, of a rational this is, conversation. No, this is not My a, only point is that when Syria was run by Assad, 10% of the population was Christian, and they lived in relative peace, considering they lived that, in the middle of the Levant. That is absolutely true, and it's also yeah. true. And so what's happened father, to those people now? His father killed 30,000 or more people. Well, what's happened? Now, let's be fair. I mean, Barack Obama certainly blew it right, left, and center. Uh, through sheer trepidation, cowardice, the inability to ever make a decision. But we are where we are, with half a million, Syri or perhaps more by now, Syrians dead. Primarily killed by the Assad regime, the Iranians, Hezbollah, and now uh, the, the, the Russians. And yet you want us to align with the Russians, with Iran, with Assad. I want us to act in America's interest and stop making so shallow, I. sweeping moral claims about countries we don't fully understand and then hope everything will be fine in the end. Because but I just saw that happen you're, you're and it didn't that, work. You're doing that with I am not doing it with Russia, you I'm merely that. saying that if a country we don't like takes active steps to kill people who are a threat to us, I'm going to pause and applaud. I'm not going to stand back and compare their leader to Hitler because it makes me feel yes. virtuous. That's what but, I'm saying. But, but, but the fault in your logic is that Assad, the Iranians, the Russians are killing the anti-Assad forces. I'm sure, I'm we sure. But you haven't ISIS. explained why I as an American should be terrified by Iran or Assad. And I think American leaders should act in the interest of their own country primarily. That's the I number one job they have, and they're not doing the it. Subject. You, you couldn't answer me on Putin, so you changed the subject to Assad. I want to know why you think Vladimir Putin's okay. I, want to I don't think he's okay. I what? think it's great that he's fighting ISIS. ISIS is a threat to us, and we're being told... I'm you sorry. Want, you want a terror, an anti-terror alliance with Russia. What does Russia tangibly bring to the table um bombs that kill isis that's my view unfortunately we're out of time we've gone long colonel <laughs> peters thank you for joining us this is spirited conversation dominating Things <laughs> like Nabra Hassanin, who was murdered while she was walking from her mosque in Washington, D.C. to a McDonald's for breakfast with a group of other teenagers. Was she killed by a Trump supporter? Oh, no, she was she, I thought she was killed by an illegal alien, wasn't she? She she was killed by a man who decided to go after her with oh, a bat. Oh, yeah, that was not a Trump teenagers. supporter, actually. That was an illegal... <laughs> Bad example, I'm sure there are others. Now, we're out of time, unfortunately, well, it was great to I talk to you. I don't know why... I'm not following your logic here, but I'd really like to pin you down on this question. So San Francisco says that one group of people does not have to follow federal law, illegal aliens. But it doesn't extend that protection. San Francisco has no other laws that I'm aware of that say to actual Americans, you don't have to obey this or that federal law. Only illegal aliens. And that strikes me as discriminatory. Someone who's born here and paid taxes on my whole working life, why do I not benefit? As long as you guys are ignoring the law, why are you only doing so on behalf of illegal aliens and not on behalf of American citizens? Why don't I become a real sanctuary? Well, you know. How about well, how do we know that? Is Assad a good guy? Do you think I don't know. I mean, ask, we align, ask the Christians align, and Jews who if, lived in Syria. If we align, <laughs> we protect if we align <laughs> with Russia, we are aligning with Iran. We are aligning with Assad. And that's bad because that's bad for American interests because why? Do you think Iran is good for American interests? I think Iran's a bad country and in a lot of ways against American and American interests. But within the context of Syria, Assad was much better for America than the people I believe you hope to replace him. The Kurds? How about Kurds? So the Kurds are going to run Syria? No, now we're in fantasy. They're, no, they're going to have an inter independent state. You're going to break up Syria into lots of little countries. Well, I'm not like, going to break it up. Okay, but that, break that's up. because it works so well in Iraq? 
it was a high energy event to say the least. <laughs> totally. <laughs> All right, look, we appreciate you coming on. We know how busy you are, and thanks for being straight up. I'm loving it. We're, we're, no, I don't get tired. It's lovely, right? High energy.